there's a lot going on in the news. And, and, I'll, and some of it has to do with, you know, the state of the media. And Michael Smirkanish has been thinking about this a lot over the years. He's been in the middle of it for, for many, many years. And he has a new novel out, a novel of politics in the media. It's titled Talk. And uh, uh, Mike, Michael Smirkanish, of course, the host of the Michael Smirkanish program on XM Sirius on the POTUS channel, number 124, 9 to noon Eastern time, Monday through Friday. Uh, he's the host of Smirkanish on CNN and Saturdays at 9 a.m. Eastern time. And Smirkanish, S-M-E-R-C-O-N-I-S-H dot com is his website. Michael, welcome back to the program. Hey, Tom, thanks for having me. It's great to have you with us. Uh, you know, you're, you're one of the good guys, and, and, and you write a hell of a book. So Thank you for that. I, I, I'm curious, you know, first, just in general, your thoughts on the state of the business that you and I are in. Deplorable. And I wanted to write a book that drew attention to the fact that I think it, it has led Washington astray and taken the country with it, because all this polarization that causes gridlock in Washington, all the obstinance, I think grows out of our business. I look back at the last 25 or 30 years that I've been a participant and paying attention. It's a time of increased polarization in the media, as well as in D.C., and I think the two are causally connected. I think that the, the media is in large part driving the bus, and I mean the world of terrestrial talk radio and cable television news. Isn't that, though, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't recall when you started in radio. I started in radio in 1967 and in commercial radio. And I was working at WITL, AM and FM, Lansing, Michigan, <laughs> and uh, it, it was the number one station in, in town. It was, you know, country western. But we had a talk show in the afternoon, the Chuck Drake show, Chuck Mefford, the, one of the three guys who was the owners of the station. And uh, it, was a, it was kind of a Smirconish show. I mean, it was, uh, Chuck was a conservative kind of Chamber of Commerce conservative Republican businessman. But, you know, he, he took all, you know, conversations. And it wasn't highly partisan. Um, but what was interesting was that there were similar shows on other stations. There were like five or six stations in Lansing. I worked at at least four of them uh, over the next 10 years. And all of them were owned by local people. To the best of my knowledge, there's no longer any locally owned stations in Lansing, Michigan. There might be one. And isn't couldn't it, isn't it possible that in 1982, when Reagan stopped enforcing the Sherman Act and we had this explosion, we had the, the mergers and acquisitions mania, and this whole, this whole new category of job opportunity, of M&A specialist, you know, and the Michael Milkins of the world, and this incredible consolidation of our media began, that, and, and, the, and along with it, the vertical integration of our media we saw this broken up in television with the primetime rule. We saw this broken up in the movie industry back in the 1930s or 40s, where the studios couldn't own the retail outlets. Um, this has not happened in the radio business. Could it not be that there are business models that are driving this, and it's not like you know evil talk show hosts or bad producers or anything else? It's just the way that the business is structured? Well, maybe. I mean, your experience in Lansing sounds a lot like my experience years later in Philadelphia. Uh, it's funny how we remember. Uh, my station was 96.5 FM WWDB, or as we called it, the talk station. Right. And when I think about the lineup on that station in the early 1990s, there was a guy named Irv Homer. He was a libertarian before the rest of us had ever heard of Ron Paul. We had an unabashed liberal named Frank Ford. He was married to the Democratic District Attorney in Philadelphia for many years. There was a... Uh, uh, a conservative named Dominic Quinn, but he was best known for his command of the English language, not ideology. And, Tom, the guy that I've been thinking a great deal about recently is Bernie Herman, because he did the 10-to-1 slot at night, and his moniker, his shtick, his brand was the gentleman of broadcasting. And I used mm. to come in and, and guest host for him when he would go away on vacation. Today, if you knocked at the door of a program director and they said, well, what are you all about? And you said, I'm the gentleman or the gentlewoman of broadcasting, you're not getting across the threshold. No. And I don't uh, ascribe it primarily, the change, to ownership changes, although that's a reality. It was still owned by a family when I was getting started. But I look at the rise of Rush Limbaugh in the early uh, 90s at a time of the first Gulf War, and that really set the stage because, and I would argue conservatives rightfully believed they didn't have a place that they could call home. 
They established talk radio as their, their clubhouse. The shock is that here we are these many years later. People have never had the amount of choice that they, that they can exercise, but they don't. They gravitate toward the like-minded in the usual clubhouses. But they don't have, doing, but they don't have the choice. They raise Michael. awareness of the danger that that possesses. I mean, they, they don't have the choice. You've got, you know, Clear Channel owns about half the major sticks in the United States and about half the minor sticks. And they own Limbaugh's show, Hannity's show, Ben Sh- Beck's show, and just pay these guys a salary. So they're, they're making all the money from their own programming. Um, Sirius XM is moving to that model. Cumulus, uh, you know, has just recently become the major competitor for for uh, uh, for Clear Channel. Uh, Cumulus controls, you know, they bought Westwood One, so they bought our show and all the other. You know, they don't own this show. I uh, independently own it, but you know, a lot of some of them are, and but they distribute it, and we're not on a single Cumulus station, and which makes me scratch my head and wonder about the future, and. And it's, but they're developing. I mean, you know, they just they just hired Mike Rogers out of Congress, right wing, you know, Republican conservative, to come up with a new kind of, you know, they're developing their own lineup to go up against Premier on the right. And I think that there's some truth to what Limbaugh used to say, and that is that on the left, there's just as much demand for intelligent conversation about the issues. But on the left, it's largely satisfied by NPR, and so on the right, they come up with this 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 reactionary stuff as a as a counterbalance to it. Could it when not I, be that my biggest you know, problem and competitor is actually NPR? I believe that. When I say there's, there's a tremendous amount of choice, I don't mean simply in radio dialogue. I mean Internet. I mean cable television. I mean satellite radio. And I'm always shocked by people who, and I have friends like this, who are conservatives, and they rely entirely on Fox drudge and talk radio right i similarly have friends who gravitate toward liberal outlets and it's like never the two shall meet my yeah. argument is you know open your mind listen to some alternative points of view it reminds me of an issue tom that's playing itself out this week relative to commencement speakers i don't understand the millennials who are unwilling to sit there and entertain for 20 minutes a point of view that that might not be in sync with their own if you can't do it on a college you're campus, talking about county rice yeah, I, I, I would argue that there's a qualitative difference between Condi Rice and William F. Buckley. There's a difference between a, a principled uh, alternative point of view and a war criminal. But that's a whole separate argument, <laughs> and we can have that another time. Well, here's uh, what I, I'm, I'm curious. We just have please. two minutes. We have a minute and a half left, Michael. I'm, I'm curious. or one minute left. I'm, I'm curious if you'd like to talk back to Lars Larson. He's, his, he's, he's saying to you that you are, you know, well, you can characterize it however you want in this minute. I haven't read it. Oh, okay. I haven't. I haven't. Well, read he basically it. says that you know. Haven't he, read it, so you'd have to summarize. Conservatives, conservatives don't lie, ever. Well, listen. I can't believe that the talking points that I hear day in and day out from talk radio hosts on the right, where the only change is the intonation of the voice. I can't believe that's the way they see the world. I don't know people who see the world entirely through liberal or conservative lenses, they don't comport with those that I interact with in my real life. They only exist in a media-driven world, because when I'm interacting with folks, they're liberal on some things, usually social issues. They're conservative on things, usually financial issues. And there's a heck of a lot, Tom, that they just haven't figured out, and they're not afraid to say so. But the certainty that exists in the media world is an aberration. I think you're right, and it's one of the reasons why almost every single day we have conservatives on this program, and I wish more of my colleagues would do it. Uh, Michael Smirkanish, host of the Michael Smirkanish program on XM Sirius, POTUS Channel 124, and Smirkanish on CNN on Saturdays at 9 a.m. And his new book, really worth checking out. It's a novel, Politics in the Media, called Talk, Smirkanish.com. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Tom. Keep up the great work, my friend. Thank you. We'll be right back.